very good evening to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. So glad to have you here again with us. Welcome to the second night of KVBC 2022 online Bible conference. Just in case you missed the opening session last night, you can still catch it at the conference landing page that you can find on our website, kvbc.org. There you will also find the Q&A session, as well as other helpful training resources to guide you in the study of the Bible. The conference will commence shortly at 8.15 p.m. Malaysia local time. In the meantime, please allow us to share with you some resources for yourself and for your local church, including a training conference in Mandarin. But before that, here is a brief introduction from our co-organizer, Evangel Book Center. Enjoy the night. Since 1955, Evangel Book Center has been bringing sound evangelical Christian literature to people residing in Malaysia. While our roots lie in the Christian Brethren Assemblies, we serve all Christians looking for Bible-centered literature they can trust. Despite the proliferation of online options for both purchasing and reading Christian material, we continue to hold to three defining propositions. First, that the goal of a church-based bookstore like ours is primarily to encourage people to read good Christian literature. This makes us ministry-based and non-profit oriented. Second, we believe that there is still room for a physical bookstore where people can browse through pre-selected Christian literature supported where possible by online platforms. And third, that less is more. This means we will not stock books simply because they are popular, but because we genuinely believe they are helpful for Christian growth. At Evangel, you will find books under virtually any category. Bibles and study Bibles. Biblical Studies and Language Guides Bible Commentaries and Dictionaries Theology Apologetics Church History Discipleship and Spirituality Evangelism Christian Living Worship Devotion Prayer Counseling and Christian Care Family Marriage Children Sunday School Young Adults Youth Christian Fiction and lots more We also have a selection of Christian posters, greeting cards, Sunday School materials, calendars, bookmarks and other church-related items Do check us out at evangelbooks.org or visit any of our branches in SS2, Penang, or Kuantan. You may also email us at office at evangelbooks.org if you wish to be on our mailing list or to order a book. We hope to see you soon as we together engage in the never-ending task of becoming good students of the Holy Scriptures 
rightly dividing the word of truth. Hello everyone, this is an invitation for you to join us at Bible Handling Skills 2022 to be held again in person in Malacca after a break of two years. Uh, this year's uh, BHS theme is Understanding the Psalms and uh, the facilitators are Reverend David Cook and Reverend David Jones from Sydney. If you're like me, you've read the Psalms a lot in the past to gain some inspiration or encouragement in times of trouble, or maybe you're helping someone who is feeling down or even leading in corporate worship. But how are we exactly are we supposed to understand the Psalms, especially in light of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? So if you'd like to understand the Psalms better, please make an effort to join us this year on the 23rd and 24th of October uh, at uh, Straits Baptist Church in Malacca. You don't have to be a Bible preacher. You don't have to be a uh, Bible study leader. You just need someone. Uh, you need to be someone who has an interest to understand the Psalms better, to grow yourself, and also to help others understand and appreciate the Psalms better. If you're interested to join us, please click the link below and uh, see you soon.新一代培训并不是什么新的模式，而是自宗教改革以来教会重新领会的原则，强调的是已经解禁的模式，忠于神话语的教导。我们觉得这个培训是有需要的，因为只有神的话语才能让我们有得救的智慧，能教训、度责
there are few emotions more powerful than hope. It's a spark inside you that brings a smile to your lips, a light that shows on your face, a feeling that lifts your head and pulls you forward. These days, hope like that often feels hard to come by. Maybe you've experienced your share of disappointments, but real hope is what the Christian faith claims to offer. A joyful expectation for the future, based on true events in the past, which changes everything about my present. Hope Explored is a three session series for anyone who is looking for a hope worth having. Whatever you do or don't believe, this is your invitation to explore, to discuss, to question, to discover. This is Hope Explored. Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Well, hi friends, this is Tim Nichols here, Chair of the Entrust Conference. And for a few minutes, I want to consider with you the need for more full-time gospel workers right here in Malaysia. A recent article I read highlights the challenges facing the Malaysian church. The average Christian in Malaysia is 55 years old and the average is rising. Uh, right now many denominations are finding it hard to uh, have enough pastors, including my own. And I'm told the situation is only set to get worse with many pastors on the verge of retirement. At the same time, the population of Malaysia increases at a rate of a thousand people a day. There is a desperate need for more churches and more Christian leaders to lead those churches. Without more churches and more Christian leaders, millions will perish without the light of the gospel and will face God's everlasting judgment. So the Entrust Conference seeks to help Christian men and women think seriously about the idea of full-time word ministry. We help people to understand what full-time ministry is all about and help them to explore whether they have the convictions, the character and the competency to pursue it themselves. Now, the conference is based on the conviction of 2 Timothy 2.2 that if we are to guard the gospel, we must faithfully pass it on to others. Now, Paul writes there, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men He'll be able to teach others also. And so if you have a burden for the lost, if you want to investigate how you can maximize your life for Christ and his gospel, then please do join us for the Entrust Conference this year. And uh, whoever you are, please join us in praying that God would raise up workers for his harvest, that the gospel can continue to grow here in Malaysia and beyond among the nations. So I hope to see you there at Entrust this year.
Welcome back to the second night of the uh, 2022 Klang Valley Bible Conference. I really especially welcome those who are outside the Klang Valley uh, but have joined us tonight. Our conference theme for this year is Dying Well. And yesterday uh, we saw that dying well requires peace with God and that Jesus died for our sins to reconcile us to the Father so that we who believe might indeed be at peace with Him. Well, tonight we will see something else that we need in order to die well, and we will see how we can receive that. Before we begin, let me lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you for gathering us together again tonight as your people around your word. And once again, we pray that your gospel will go forward, that believers will be edified, that people will come to trust in your Son, and that you will glorify your name. Please give us hearts to hear your word, to believe your promises, to trust your sovereign goodness, and rejoice in your salvation. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that we are children of the day, children of light. And since we belong to the day, now Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, let us be sober, having put on a breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. Let's sing about this together. love he will come for he 
explanation and application of the central message of the text or passage of the Bible. Recognizing that the faithful preaching and teaching of God's Word holds a central place in all our churches, we aim to assist preachers and teachers of that Word through workshops, seminars and last but not least, the CEP course. The CEP course seeks to train and nurture preachers and teachers in the expository principles that will enable them to handle God's Word rightly and effectively. Through a combination of classroom instruction, model expositions, and extensive hands-on exercises in small groups, you will learn and apply these principles into your preaching and teaching ministry. The course comprises four modules. Foundations introduces you to the core principles of expository preaching. Having completed this first and compulsory module, you can then progress to any of the other three modules, namely preaching the Old Testament, preaching the New Testament, and then theology, both biblical and systematic, and preaching. In addition, we also address practical issues related to your personal preparation and development as a preacher or teacher. While primarily focused upon equipping preachers, experience informs us that the course has benefited those who are involved in teaching God's Word in one capacity or another. Do join us, beginning with our next Foundations module. You'll be amazed at what you will learn to be a worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. We look forward to having you with us. Hi, I'm Si Yuan. I work full-time with Scripture Union in the children's ministry and teaching kids the Bible is part of what I do at SU. Because of this responsibility, I'm always up for trainings and courses related to my area of ministry. Before I attended CEP, I used to just draw out moral lessons to kids and bring their attention to faith heroes in my storytelling. But my old approach often missed the intended meaning of a Bible passage and I superimposed my ideas on the text. Now that's dangerous. Ever since I've started my studies with CEP, I've developed the necessary skills and core principles to handle God's Word faithfully. The most important learning outcome I've gained from CEP is this. To stay on the line of Scripture, never straying above or below. CEP was definitely beyond my expectations. Hi everyone! In conjunction with KBBC 2022, Evangel Book Centre is offering a whole load of books at very special discounts. So take my word for it, these are good deals for good books. Now our speaker, Dr. Jensen, has recommended several books to consider reading for our topic tonight, which is Dying Well. I will tell you how you can order at the very end. But first off is Finishing Our Course with Joy by Dr. J.I. Packer. Now, this slim 100-page book exhorts everyone who reaches what is considered old age not to, quote, simply sit back and take it easy, but rather to embrace old 
age as an opportunity for continued learning, careful planning, and heartfelt discipleship, so that we might enjoy continuing to glorify God in our aging and finish our lives with joy. I thoroughly enjoyed this five-hour read, and I'm sure you will too. Finishing our course with joy by Dr. J.I. Packer. Now, next, The Nearing Home by Billy Graham. Now, like Dr. Packer, uh, Billy Graham's own approach to his last days were exemplary. Uh, You will recall that he died in 2018, just short of his 100th birthday. This book by one of the world's greatest evangelists explores the challenges of aging while gleaning foundational truths from Scripture. Now, Billy Graham says this, When granted many years of life, growing old in age is natural, but growing old with grace is a choice. Growing older with grace is possible for all who will set their hearts and minds on the giver of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ. Nearing Home by Billy Graham. Now, in Be Still My Soul, Nancy Guthrie brings together 25 essays from both classic and contemporary theologians, Bible teachers and missionaries, uh, famous names such as uh, John Calvin, Charles Spurgeon, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, John Piper, Corrie ten Boom, and Joni Erickson Tada. Now, each entry expounds on a Bible verse, leading readers to see and be comforted by God's perspective, purpose, and provision in suffering. So be still, my soul. Uh, this next one is part of the really powerful New Studies in Biblical Theology, or NSBT series, uh, which generally explores particular biblical themes almost comprehensively in one volume. Uh, in this one, Paul Williamson delves into the ultimate questions of life surrounding death and the afterlife. As you would expect of the NSBT series, this one is a must-have for those involved in teaching and in pastoral ministries, uh, Death and the Afterlife by Paul Williamson. Uh, now, this next one is uh, by one of the familiar faces at KBBC, uh, Dr. D.A. Carson, and I have in fact reviewed this one before during one of our earlier sessions, How Long, O Lord? Uh, this one is about suffering and evil and how we deal with these subjects. Uh, now, this book is currently not in stock at Evangel, but rest assured we are making, uh, making moves to bring in copies uh, not too long from now. Now, apart from these books recommended by our speaker, I would be remiss if I did not highlight those books by Dr. Jensen himself. Now, while these are not directly related to the topic for our consideration at this moment, I would like to heartily commend these to you. Uh, although we have just run out of stock of Dr. Jensen's books, uh, again, be assured that we are making arrangements to bring in several of them very soon. Now, how do you go about ordering these books? Now, first go to evangelbooks.org or Google Evangel Book Center, and you will get there. Now, instead of seeing March 2022 specials, which you see on your screen, you will see KVBC specials. Simply click on that banner and you will get to the order page. At the how to order page, you will see instructions about how to order the books. Just follow the instructions. That said, do note the following. The best way to get the books is to head on over to Evangel Book Center in SS2. And that's just across the road from McDonald's. If you order online, or online uh, you will be informed via email about the arrangements and additional delivery charges, which will probably be about an additional nine ringgit or so. Uh, while you're at it, do check out the other books and promotions we have there too. Like I said, we have lots of books on discount in conjunction with KVBC this year. Blessings in Jesus Christ, everyone. Thank you. Well, as mentioned earlier, uh, tonight I'd like to introduce you, uh, for at least those who don't know, uh, the Reverend Tan Ke Ho. I'd like to introduce you to the Reverend Tan Ke Ho. 
Uh, Kehu is the Ministry Director for KBBC Trust, and he's also the Ministry Director for Equip Gospel Ministries. Uh, and this is because uh, KBBC and Equip are in the process of merging. Uh, so Kehu, tell us a bit uh, about the merger uh, and why it's happening. Well, hi, Andrew, and good evening, everyone. Yeah, uh, yeah basically, uh, KBBC and Equip, we are in the process of merging, uh, a process that began uh, 1st January this year. Um, some of you may know that uh, since uh, since Equip was uh, first set up in 2010, that's uh, over 10 years ago, actually KBBC has always enjoyed uh, working alongside this ministry uh, over the past uh, um, past uh, almost uh, 11 years. And actually throughout these years, the two boards have actually contemplated on a number of occasions whether we should actually uh, um, uh, pull our resources together and that they will better serve the churches in that manner because we actually do share a lot in common. We even share the same uh, chairman. Um, but uh, recently, the COVID pandemic presented yet another opportunity for the two boards to take a hard look at it. And as it turned out this time round, it was actually a fairly straightforward decision. Uh, we should merge and that was what the board decided to do. Okay, so what's uh, what's going to happen after this? What should we expect? Yeah, so uh, um, the ministry merger, basically uh, lots of things are still being discussed. But uh, one thing is for sure is that some things won't change, like the core DNA of our ministries. Uh, to encourage godliness through expository Bible teaching, that will remain our core conviction. And our primary approach will remain, will continue to we to prepare Christians for works of gospel ministry in partnership with local churches through biblical, theological, and ministry skills training. You'll find that in the Equip uh, uh, page, uh, Equip uh, website. Uh, but what we hope will change is that we will grow to be more intentional, more focused in how we go about doing this. Uh, when KBBC uh, first started, for most Christian communities we were a part of, systematic exposition of God's word was either a novel idea, they haven't heard of it before, or it was an approach that uh, they would deem unsuitable, unsuited for Malaysian churches. But we are so glad and thankful to God that today, there are actually churches in many parts of Malaysia where faithful Bible exposition has become a staple diet in their ministry. While we indeed celebrate this, uh, it does mean for KBBC and Equip that we will need to revisit our ministries in the light of this development so that we don't just do same old, same old, but we grow to be more intentional and more focused. Mm. So what does that mean? How do we be more intentional? Um, well, we are actually still in the midst of prayerfully working through various things. But one thing, Andrew, is uh, already obvious to us and that we need to be even more focused in how we come alongside churches to identify, prepare, and grow faithful ministers of God's Word. Uh, three areas in particular. Uh, firstly, uh, the, through the CEP course and the CEP workshop, how we can be even more intentional to come alongside those who are either preparing or already in the ministry of preaching and teaching God's Word how to uh, any, encourage one another to grow in faithfulness and competency. This is something we need to keep doing. Secondly, uh, equip certificate and degree program. Uh, I think many are already quite familiar with the certificate program. Maybe less people know that equip actually has a fully accredited degree program in partnership with a local seminary. So we want to be more intentional to strengthen our distinctives uh, namely, uh, what it means to have a robust gospel-centered biblical theology and also a strong emphasis on biblical exposition throughout the entire, entire degree program. So we need to continue to strengthen that. And thirdly, and, la and um, but not least, and trust. We want to be even more focused to engage with pastors and church leaders on how we can uh, identify and groom future gospel ministers because the need is greater than ever. 
Okay, that sounds great, Keho. And now on behalf of all the people who are uh, with us at, uh, at KVBC this year, uh, can I ask how can we support uh, as uh, Equipment KVBC uh, go about doing this? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, the fact that you are here at the conference, uh, that's already a great encouragement to us. But we certainly would value uh, your ongoing prayers as we continue to work through all the details on how we, uh, actually we ought to be moving forward. Uh, we certainly do not want to take anything for granted. Uh, secondly, we will and we actually do need a lot more resources as in people. Yeah, in every area of the ministry, we need more volunteers uh, to actually help promote, to take part in, in the various training programs, but also even uh, to uh, facilitate and uh, to uh, in, even take part in the training ministry itself. So if uh, this is something that uh, any of you are, uh, would, uh, are thinking of, we would certainly love to hear from you. And uh, thirdly, and uh, not least, uh, if some of you are in the position to contribute financially, uh, we certainly will appreciate that as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kei Ho. Thank you. God bless. God bless you too. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening again. And here we are talking about the great subject of dying well. And this is the second of our three talks. Let's pray and ask for the Lord to bless us as we uh, concentrate on his word by his spirit. Dear Lord and loving Heavenly Father, 
We thank you that in our ignorance and our hardness of heart, you shine the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, open our eyes so that we can see him with all his glory and learn to worship you. And we pray now that as we think about this subject, in the light of your word, with the help of your spirit, we may indeed see the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that our hearts will be given to him and we will glorify him so that we ourselves may share in the worship of heaven. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Many years ago, there was a British gentleman called Bertrand Russell. You may have heard of him. He was in his day a very famous uh, philosopher, public intellectual, uh, mathematician, Nobel Prize winner, and a famous atheist. Bertrand Russell wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Christian, and I can remember when I was first a Christian as a young teenager picking up that book to see what the other point of view was in case I'd made some terrible mistake. It was one of the best things I ever did uh, because really I thought his arguments were so poor I'd rather be a Christian. At any rate, that may be, that may be wrong on my part, but that's how it was for me. Bertrand Russell once wrote these words that have become quite famous. He was talking from an absolutely atheistic point of view, saying, this is all there is. And he says, no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought or feeling can preserve an individual's life beyond the grave. The whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. And then he says, only on the scaffolding of this truth, that there is no God, that this universe is all there is, that it's destined for destruction, only on the scaffolding of this truth, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation safely be built? Unyielding despair. Well, he had a big influence in his own day. It's interesting to uh, read about him because his daughter, Catherine Tate, her name was, who lived into her 90s, by the way, became a Christian. She and her husband uh, moved by some yearning, went to church and heard the gospel of Jesus properly described and turned to Christ in submission and faith and gave themselves to the Lord. And she said this about her father, who she knew, of course, very, very well and whom she admired very greatly. She said, in the depths of his soul, there was an empty space that had once been filled by God and he never found anything to put in it. Only on the depths of undying despair can life be built. There was in his soul an empty space. Well, that's our world. That's our choice too, in the end. Think for a moment about the mystery that you experience and I experience of time itself. Time seems to us to be obvious, it's everywhere, we're, we're very conscious of time, but it's strange, isn't it? Uh, once the past is the past, it is untouchable. It's as if we're standing in a river with water flowing down towards us and behind us it's just simply turned to ice. Uh, in, in our present experience, we, we feel the water, but we can't grab it, we can't stop it. Uh, this second has now passed. Uh, every moment passes, it passes, we can't sort of grasp time. But worse than that, that which is coming towards us is chaotic. It's the, it's the, it's the water of the waterfall, the water of the rapids that are coming towards us. We can't tame it, we can't order it, we can't tell it what to do. The present is ungraspable and the future is chaotic. 
your future, my future, you may think it's all very clear, you're perhaps at the university and you know that in three years time you are going to graduate and a job has been offered to you and you've got the whole thing worked out. But you know, and I know, that these things may never happen. The future is chaotic. If death is the end and there is no future, then Russell, Bertrand Russell, is right. You ought to be building your life on unyielding despair, for there is no hope. But then that creates all sorts of problems, doesn't it? Think about the meaning of your life for a moment. Um, all of us hunger for meaning in life, uh, understandable. Uh, meaning, if you think about it for a little while, arises from purpose. Uh, and in a sense, you're never more alive than when you know that the big exam is coming. <laughs> you've, you've got this goal, here it is there, or, or you're aiming to be something as a graduate. And you're aiming for your business to grow. You, you've, got, you've got a goal, a purpose, and that fills each present moment with a sense of meaning because you're walking towards that purpose. The purpose creates the meaning. But if you are purposeless, or if you realise the truth that with the best goal in the world, it may be unobtainable, but in any case, it may disappear, then life comes without purpose and without meaning. Only anxiety fills its place. Now again, let me apologise to you, I'm speaking, you, you can tell this of course all the time that I'm speaking very much from this sort of Australian point of view here and my experience here and uh, I'm speaking to people with a, with a very different experience of life but nonetheless uh, sometimes I ask uh, doctors or um, teachers or, or other professionals, lawyers and so forth, to tell me about what's going on in the Australian soul and I suspect not just Australians and what they particularly mention to me these days is anxiety. And anxiety, of course, is fear about the future. Oh, people might have goals, they might have ambitions, they might be doing very well, but undergirding it, deep within, there is anxiety. And this is testified to by other means as well, other uh, uh, people looking at the Australian scene and I suspect not just in Australia, I suspect that what we're talking about is very human. Furthermore, and uh, here is something, yes I agree that it's Australian or it's Western at least, but I think it's going to spread like a disease and that is aloneness. We have virtually destroyed marriage uh, people just live together, it's a very unsettled existence. We're destroying families. It's easier to get out of a marriage now than it is to get out of a business partnership in our part of the world. And increasingly those who are looking ahead are talking about the number of people who are going to die alone. Who are going to live in their... Look, I'll give you an illustration. I was talking to a veterinary surgeon one day and talking about, I said, tell me about people, not just animals, tell me about people. He said, one thing he said I've noticed in the last 10 to 15 years, he said how many people are now treating their animals as though they are other people. There's a deep loneliness and aloneness that will only grow as time goes on. And so those of us who die with a family around us will be less and less And as my friend who looks after um, dying people told me, there is nothing more sad than a person who dies alone, she said, and I have been to funerals where I have been the only mourner, even though I only knew this person for a couple of weeks. She said, it is desolating. The increasing aloneness of those who die without love, and yet love is the central need of the human being, the center of life, and we die without love. But we Christians, we have a better story. We have the good news, we have the good news to share. And our first part of our good news I talked about yesterday, and it is that dying well requires peace with God, who is love and at the heart of the universe. 
Today I'm going to say dying well also requires the peace of God, and I'll explain that. Dying well requires the peace of God. So we turn now to the source of hope. Bertrand Russell, undying despair. He knew his philosophy ended up exactly there. He was right. But I'm saying to you that we have hope. Not just optimism, not just a sunny sort of, I'm, I'm an optimistic sort of person, hope. Whether you're a pessimist or an optimist, you can have hope. And here it is. Our hope, first of all, is in the righteous God, the one God who made the universe. Now listen very briefly, let's talk about that for a moment. He is the one God of all power. This universe, I believe in the spirit world, but the spirit world is nothing compared to the power of the one true God who rules over all things, including the entire spirit world, have nothing to do with it, relate to God. That's how we are. Listen, Psalm 119 verses 89 to 91. Psalm 119 verses 89 to 91. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. By your appointment they stand each day and then for all things are your servants. Yes, the insects. Yes, the grains. Yes, the mighty mountains. Yes, the infinite space. All things are the servants of the living God. What good news is that? You're not going to pass out of his influence into some other influence. It's not a contest between Satan and God, equal terms. God is in charge of every, every aspect of this universe. And he is a righteous God. He is a good God. His purposes are entirely righteous and he will work them out in his own time and for his own reasons. Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. God is not just the God in charge of all things, like sort of a personal gravity or something like this. <laughs> He is the God who is in charge of all things for his own purposes and he is a good God and his purposes are good and we will see this. He is the Lord of all time and space, past, present and future. We can't control time. He is the Lord of time. He has created all things in time. So Psalm 139 verses 4, 7 to 8 and 13. Listen, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I plumb down to Sheol, to the depths, you are there. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Isn't that grand? Particularly, you may not be too happy with your body, but you know, the Lord has made it, and you are fearfully and wonderfully made by the God who loves the universe that he has made and rejoices in it, for he is a good God and a righteous God who will bring all things to rights according to his purposes. Trust him, you can. Now, this good God is a speaking God. Uh, the idols of man don't speak, or if they do, they speak with false voices. But our God is a God of speech. Remarkable, isn't it? You know, blindness is a terrible thing. Awful to be blind. But we don't realise how, how awful deafness is. When you're deaf, you know, it's very difficult to relate to other people. You're forever saying, uh, ex excuse me, say that again. And people speak at you with a raised voice. They don't treat you as another human being. You go to a restaurant to have a family meal and you can't hear what's being said, even though you've got your hearing aid turned up. Deafness is, a, it, it, deafness is bad because the word is what 
Relationships are built on words. We, we speak to each other. And those words are infinitely, they can be precious, they can be damning and horrible as well, but words are so important for relationships. And hence, I've said that discovering there's one true God is the good news, and here's the next bit of good news, that this God is a speaking God. He speaks, even though in many ways we are deaf to him, he speaks, and he speaks Here's another, here's another thing. You've heard people speaking languages you don't understand and you feel alienated from them. And oh, <laughs> Where are you when people are speaking other foreign languages to you? It's difficult, isn't it? Our God speaks our language. Um, it's not an accident that when Jesus comes amongst us, he's called the Word of God because God speaks your language. Now, uh, his word can be translated from the original languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, but there, it is infinitely translatable. It's not a book that can't be translated. It's a book that calls out to be translated because God is a speaking God and wishes to speak to you and does speak to you in your language, in our human language, in our humanness, he speaks to us. What a God, what a God he is. Now, he speaks in all sorts of ways, too. The Bible's not just a boring law book or something like that. The Bible is a storybook. It's got great stories, as you know. It has Proverbs. Aren't the Proverbs wonderful? It has Ecclesiastes. <laughs> you can see I love Ecclesiastes. It has history. It has letters written. It has gospel. It has law. It has all sorts of things. It is a very rich book full of interesting things. But preeminently, if you like... It, the way I see it is that the structure of the Bible, the unfolding story of the Bible, it's not just a whole set of unrelated stories. It's, it's got structure, and there's a structure to the Bible, and it's based on what the Bible calls covenants, and at the heart of covenant, they all, the idea of covenant, the old covenant, the new covenant, the Old Testament, the New Testament, same thing, the heart of it all are promises. Yes, promises. Now, I want you to think about promises for a moment. What are promises? When do we make promises? Well, we make promises ourselves when we are trying to control the future. Because all promises are future looking. No point promising things that have already happened. They've happened. You promise for the future. And it's our attempt to control the chaos that's coming towards us. It's our attempt to sort of and build something that can stand so that we can rely on it, so that we can step across it, so to speak, the, the stepping stones in the water of history and, and, of, and of time. It's our attempt to control the future so that we can walk forwards with confidence. And they're good. I'm so glad about promises. A certain lady made me some very significant promises over 50 years ago, and she's kept them. And I've kept mine as well. And it's been immensely fruitful and rewarding and wonderful. Oh, yes, we can keep promises, though sometimes, often, promises aren't kept, of course. Promises are future. Promises are always verbal. You can't have a non-verbal promise. Uh, and how do you receive a promise? How do you use a promise? How do you make, make use of the promise? Well, the first step in making use of a promise is faith. You've got to trust it. And you don't just trust the promise, you trust the person who's made the promise. Some people make a promise and you wouldn't trust it because you know the person. The promise is there, but the person is untrustworthy. So when you use a promise, it is because you trust the person who's made the promise. Even so, even the best of people, even the most scrupulous, the upright, and the most wonderful of people, however, can't always be trusted. There is sin, but of course there's frailty and weakness. I can make my promises, but the world crashes in and I can't keep my promises. I lose all my money. I lose my health. I lose my way. 
and the promise fails. But God, oh, God, <laughs> thank God, is a great promise maker, isn't he? He is the promise maker who controls the future, whose promises can be trusted because he is the God of the universe, because he is all powerful, because there's one thing he can't do, and that's tell lies. Isn't that good? That's power too, not to be able to lie. He is utterly trustworthy. And hence, not surprisingly, the Bible is structured around the promises of God, promises to Abraham, promises to David, promises that all look forward, promises that look forward and are fulfilled, and then there's a further fulfillment awaiting. The promises of God, there's going to be a new covenant, he says. The promises are coming. And so we come to the content of hope, for our hope is based on those promises. You see that? Your hope is faith-looking future. You have trust in the promises, and that therefore fills the future. It gives purpose and meaning, therefore, because your hope is based, is structured. It, hope is another word for faith looking forward, because it's, <laughs> it's taken by the promises and pushed forward. Now, what is the content of your hope as a Christian person? Well, your content of your hope is the Saviour, who is the Lord. There's a, there's a, sorry, I think all verses in the Bible are wonderful. I'm going to say it again. There's a wonderful verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Do you know it? All the promises of God find their yes in him, that is in Christ. God makes so many promises. You can go around the garden picking them, if you like, and saying, look at this one, look at that one. But in the end, they are all in Christ. Have him and you have the promises. They're aimed at you, you've got them. He comes, the word of God, truly man, truly man, the true Adam, who in this case does not fall. He sends Satan scurrying. He fulfills the promises of God. He lives under the rule of God, unlike Adam. He lives in the kingdom of God. He announces the promised kingdom. He tells us that the kingdom is at hand and he calls for repentance and faith that we too may come into the kingdom, be where we were meant to be to start with. He dies to save his people for the kingdom. He is resurrected from the dead. The first fruit, the new age has dawned. You see, you can look back and say, ah, oh, the new age has begun already. How, what's the sign of the new age? Resurrection. In the, in, in the new age, all will be resurrected. What we have is the resurrection of the God-man. He's not resurrected because he's God, because he didn't need to be resurrected as God. He is resurrected because he is one of us. You understand that, don't you? that he is one of us. And when I say he is one of us, I'm not saying he was one of us. I'm saying he is one of us. He is the man, the God-man, yes. The future begins with his resurrection. The kingdom of God is here. Not just future, it is present as well. He now reigns, you see, as king over all things. He is the king of God's kingdom, if you like. And one of the great things he does Romans 8, Hebrews 7, uh, Hebrews 7 tells us he prays for us. He ever lives to pray for us. He is praying for you as he rules over all things. We talk, uh, and rightly so, about the cross. We mention the cross many, many times, but we also need to mention the resurrection, and we need to mention the present rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, described in passages like Ephesians chapter 1, uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and other places in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Christ is Lord and ruling now. Of course, the cross is the pivotal moment in the whole biblical story. <laughs> we can never take away from the cross. But there is even more to the salvation that God is doing. He sends his spirit. Jesus sends the spirit. And that is how we come to know him. And then he will return, raise his people from immortality, Give them new life in the image of the one man from heaven that he is. We will bear the image of the man from heaven, do you see? He is our brother. 
He is our Lord. And all these things are described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 47 to 49. Listen to 1 Thessalonians, at least 4, verses 13 to 18. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, who have died, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an angel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, uh, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What's your future? Oh, well, I intend to um, pass my exam shortly and then I will... <laughs> What's the future that matters? Here is the glory of the future. Glory, uh, glory is a word that, that is brightness, shining. You, you have to turn away from glory, but there's more to it than that. The word glory also has the idea of weight, gold preciousness. It, it's, a, it's a word where all is light, but all is, is heavy with glory, if I can put it like that. And you and I, even in this life, as Christian believers, we are being changed from one degree of glory to another by the Lord who is the Spirit. As we look at Christ in the Word, so the Spirit takes the Word and we look at Christ and we are being changed in godliness from one degree of glory to another, 2 Corinthians 3. And we behold the glory of the Lord. And one day, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, we're told, <sighs> we know God is glorious, we know Jesus is glorious, but one day we will wear ourselves an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You will be glorious. We're on the walk home. We're on the walk home. You may be a fair way back yet, though you don't know. I'm a lot closer than you are, at least in theory, but we're all one day closer home. We're going to be with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8, our future is to be with him. A place which he has prepared for us, as John uh, records Jesus saying, in my Father's house there are many rooms. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. In other words, our future is, we, we may think, oh, what's heaven like? I don't know. It's, it's sort of vague. And is it balloons float? <laughs> what, what is it? Well, it's not vague. It's not vague. There are, so, there are a million things we don't know about what the future is. I know that. But what we do know is better. No, no, no. What we know is who we know. And he is our future. You know Jesus. You read, read all about him. You know him. You've walked with him as a Christian believer. Then you know and love Jesus. And our future is to be with Jesus. Isn't that enough for you? To be with him. And so 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, we will always be with the Lord. But not only with Jesus, our future is to be like Jesus, isn't that? Don't you, aren't there certain people you want to be like? And who else would you want to be like than Jesus? And your future is to be like him. Just as you're born the image of the dust man, so you will bear the image of the man from heaven. You will be like him and in him for that matter. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That is our destiny, to be conformed to the image of his Son. And all things work together for that purpose, Romans 8, 28. Not only are we going to be with the Lord, we are, going to be, we are going to be like the Lord, we are going to be for the Lord. We are going to be for Christ. We are going to be working for him. Heaven's not just <laughs> sort of a rather boring, lengthy period or something like this. No, no, no. Whether we're at home or we're away. Now, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9 just grabbed me uh, last year. I, I hadn't noticed this. 2 Corinthians 5, whether we are at home with him in the heavens 
or a way, making our way there, it is our aim to please him. Your present aim in life is to please the Lord Jesus, yes? Well, that will always be your aim. You'll be working with him and for him. You'll be like him. He will be with you and never leave you in your resurrected body. Paul, facing death, says this. He was facing death. Philippians 1.21 For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Hear him? My desire, he says, is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better to be with Christ. To, for that is far better, he says. Do you believe it? <laughs> well, that's what the Bible says. What about grief? We grieve, uh, 1 Thessalonians tells us, but not as those without hope. Grief marks our going as we as we are getting ready to go, we, we grieve. We grieve the loss of those whom we love. And in a sense, Christians grieve more than anyone for our hearts are filled with love and love is hurt when, when death occurs. We are hurt, those left behind are hurt. But our grief is marked by hope. Hope that will never disappoint us any more than Jesus will disappoint you. He is our hope. And those who leave us, we will see again. In Psalm 23, we're told about the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd. He walks with you. It is as if he smiles at you. <laughs> he meets you on the way. He takes you through the valley of the shadow of death. And he meets you at the end of that path all safe for all eternity. You sit and eat with him. <laughs> Eating's a funny thing to do. You can be eating in heaven. Well, whatever it is, the point is that you eat with people when you're at peace with them, when there's a festivity, a marriage feast. is one of those great moments, isn't it? And you will sit with him at his table. And so preparing for death. First of all, we must have peace with God. Romans chapter 5 speaks about peace with God. Romans 5 verse 1. Now being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Romans 5 also tells us that we were the enemies of God. It's a very strong word. We were the enemies of God. Don't make bad enemies. Well, we were made God our enemy. But now through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, we are justified through faith, simple faith, and we have peace with God. Romans 5, verse 1. But then it goes on and talks about this life, and in Romans 5, verses 1 to 5, it tells us that this life is going to be marked by sorrow and pain and struggle and suffering. We know that. We're not relieved from those burdens, but we are given peace with God and we stand in his grace and as we go through those burdens, God is changing us, making us the persons that we need to be to spend eternity with his son. There's a purpose even in the sufferings that we are going through. God has not lost us. He is in charge. And it tells us in verse 5, in a remarkable verse, it tells us that the spirit of God fills our heart with love, uh, not our love for God or for others, but rather the knowledge that he loves us. And here we have assurance for the wounded conscience. Do you remember I spoke last time about do you have a guilty conscience? And I guess the longer you go on and the more you look back and think of the things you've said and done or failed to do, you will sometimes have a guilty conscience. But the Spirit of God assures you. And how does he assure you? Look again, Romans 5, verse 5, and then verse 6. For this we know, that Christ died for the ungodly. He takes you to the cross of Christ and helps you to see that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. That conscience itself doesn't have the last word. Conscience is not your judge. Jesus is your judge. And he is also the advocate. And so you may have not only peace with God, but the peace of God. Now we turn to Philippians chapter 4, 
verses 5 to 7 to start with. The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything, he says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. I'm not talking here about sort of a subjective peace, though that is involved in it, but it's a peace which is based on the sovereignty of God, our knowledge that he is in charge of all things, that he is completely righteous, that he is in charge of all things, and he's completely good. That's we, that is the God we know, and therefore fear, fear of uh, spirits, fear of, uh, of what is coming next, fear of failure, is not the great word in your life. It is the truth about God and God as sovereign. And as a result, you pray. You're a man, you are a woman of prayer. You bring your anxieties, you bring your, your, your hopes, you bring your longings, you bring them, and you bring them to the Lord of the universe, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you bring them and you leave them with him. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will then garrison your heart, will guard your heart. For you will have that deep, ins that deep assurance that you are loved, that God is in charge, and that your hopes are secure. And he tells us then to be content. Philippians 4, verses 11 to 13. I've learned in whatever situation I'm in, and he'd been in a few, to be content. I know how to be brought low, I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learnt the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Contentment. Compare Bertrand Russell. If you read his biography, you'll find that it was a restless, unfulfilled life, damaging to others, Permissive, very permissive, and as his daughter told us, hungering always because there was an empty place in his soul from which he had banished God. He knew. On the other hand, what you can have, you may not be Bertrand Russell, I'm not Bertrand Russell, you're not a Nobel Prize winner, you haven't, you're not the great philosopher, doesn't matter. You have something better than all that. You have a knowledge of the true God and you may have contentment. What happens when you do fall ill and it's pretty serious? Be careful not to fall into the danger of what I call the faith trap, where people tell you, if only you have enough faith, you will be cured. And uh, you, you, you struggle within yourself to have enough faith. And if you have enough faith, cancer will be defeated and you will go your way. That's not what we mean by faith. Of course we believe in a God who can cure people of cancer if he wishes to, and he does. Of course we have a God who's in charge of all things, but faith is, if you'd like, contentment. Faith, you can by all means pray if you're ill, by all means pray for a cure, pray for healing, of course, why not? But don't think to yourself, well, if only I have enough faith. That's not the faith of the Bible. Uh, pray as often as you like. Let your prayers again and again be to the Lord, saying, may I be cured. But don't think to yourself that faith, if you just had enough faith, you could somehow twist God's arm and make him do what you wished him to do. No, that's not faith. Faith is trust. Faith is trust in the purposes of God, whatever they may be. And in the end, we all die. We all suffer. But God is still in charge. Contentment is trust in the Lord. Put your life into the hands of God. Talk to him as much as you like. But remember that deep down, your faith leads to contentment and to peace. And peace will garrison your heart because you know the God who rules all things. Well... That is why I say that dying well requires peace with God and the peace of God. Read Philippians 4. And I want to ask you some questions. Are you ready? These are your questions. These are private questions. These are questions for your soul. What is your hope? What hope dominates your life? 
What's your hope? Where do you find meaning in life? Your hope will tell me that. And then what will give you peace when you face death? They're the questions. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would give us all that peace that passes all understanding. We pray that you would garrison our hearts with peace. Pray that you would teach us that you are the sovereign God of all things, time included. We pray that you would give us contentment wherever we are with a deep and ever deepening faith in you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that our lives will be changed from one degree of glory to another. And we pray that you would fill our hearts with hope, hope of being and wearing the eternal weight of glory as we gaze at the face of our Saviour and we say our future is to be with you and like you and for you for all eternity. Help us to be glad in the hope you've given us. For Christ's sake, amen.
Hi there once again. Can I tell you a little bit about our CEP course? Uh, the CEP course is the heart of what we do at the KVBC Trust. Uh, it's a course to train preachers in expository preaching. Uh, it's very part-time, you can do it while working, uh, whether you're working in church or in the marketplace, and it's actually also a key part of the equipped degree in theology. Uh, there are actually four modules uh, in the CEP course. Uh, the first module is called Foundations. Uh, and you can find out more details uh, about the Foundations course and in fact about all the courses, all the modules uh, in, from our website. Uh, if you're a preacher or you're training to be a preacher uh, or you're teaching the Bible regularly in another context, uh, can I urge you at least consider upgrading your skills in Bible handling by taking this course. We all need to keep on learning and growing uh, and it'll be really important for us uh, to keep on growing in this area uh, as well as in other ones. Now, in the meantime, I can also encourage you uh, to sign up for Peter Jensen's seminar on preaching doctrine uh, that's coming up on August the 27th. Uh, if you're a preacher, or the Bible Handling Skills seminars on the 23rd and 24th of October, if you wanna, just want to learn how to handle the Bible better. If you haven't done Bible Overview that yet, then Bible Overview, please. It's a great way to see how the whole Bible fits together uh, and how Christ is the fulfillment of it all. Uh, Equip Gospel Ministries runs this with uh, materials from Moore College once a week for 10 weeks, all the details you can get from the Equip website. And Bible Overview is the first module in the Equip MBS Certificate in Theology, which will give you a firm grounding in the Scriptures and Theology uh, for lay ministry in your church or parachurch organization. If you're someone who's willing to consider vocational ministry in the future, then please come for the Entrust Conference in November. Great way to find out more about the full-time ministry in Malaysia, uh, work out the questions you need to ask uh, and the questions you need to answer uh, as you consider it. And do explore the seminary level courses offered by Equip in partnership with MBS uh, to equip the next generation of gospel-centered, Bible-based, disciple-making church leaders. Uh, details of that are on the Equip website. Christianity Explored and their new offering, Hope Explored, will help you share the gospel with others. And we'll tell you more about that. Uh, don't forget to go to Evangel uh, or to their website uh, to order your conference books. And if you're someone who's benefited from KBBC ministry, please partner with us financially uh, using online bank transfer. Details again are on the conference page. Finally, if you have questions from tonight, please submit them uh, at uh, the link from our conference page and tune in at 7.15 p.m. tomorrow for the Q&A session before the 8.15 p.m. conference starts. Let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have spoken to us by your Spirit through your Word. And we thank you that in your Word you give us good and precious promises. We thank you for your sovereignty and your faithfulness which assures us that you can and will keep those promises. And we thank you tonight especially for keeping your promise to raise your son from the dead and exalt him as king. We thank you that you promise that you work all things for our good. We thank you that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord Jesus and that one day you will raise us from death as you raise Jesus and you will bring us to the new creation where we will love and joy and serve you forever. In the meantime, please help us to trust your purposes and be content in your plans. We thank you for the peace that comes from trusting you, knowing that we are loved, that you are in control, and that our hope in Christ is secure. And may that peace which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. See you tomorrow night.